from the University of Minnesota, and he is presenting work done together with uh, Anthony Duncan. <laughs> but you are making the talk. I'm going to give it to you, yes. Okay. All right, so I apologize for showing you my record collection earlier. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so, 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 so the, the way this is going to work as usual, like uh, I'll, I'll do the, I'll give the presentation, that's all I know, and then Tony is going to handle your, your questions. Um, so uh, let, me, uh, let me flash this up, because like, you may not have seen the, uh, the abstract. I'm not going to read it to you, but just to give you an idea as to what it is that we're going to be uh, talking about. And so we're, uh, we're going to be looking at two of the successes of the, uh, of the old quantum theory, namely the explanation of the Stark effect, of the splitting of spectral lines in electric fields, and fine structure from the point of view of like modern quantum mechanics, and, sh and we'll show you that in a way, like the old quantum theory got lucky. That's what our talk, what our title is supposed to indicate. You know, one half, one half equals one. And because everything gets shifted by one rather than by this one half, uh, like the empirical predictions like are all fine, but this comes at the cost, and that's the, the, sort of the last part of the, uh, of the talk, so is to, is it comes at the cost of sort of seriously distorting the underlying physics. And in particular, like the relation that shows up in the relation between the uh, quantum numbers for energy and angular momentum. So, so the overview of the talk then is so uh, we're, uh, we're going to be talking about the Stark effect uh, first, the old and the new quantum theory. I'm going to be I'm going to try and be as brief as possible about this because this is work that we've already published. So the, the volume of uh, uh, of the Copenhagen conference, like to celebrate. The centenary of the Bohr atom just came out. There's a lengthy paper by us. The more technical uh, uh, details of that have been published, meanwhile, in uh, studies in uh, 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 studies in history and philosophy of quantum physics. Um, so then uh, we're, we're I'm going to be talking about the bit that we only do in that second studies paper, like the, the WKV approximation and some of the stuff that uh, Christoph was uh, say referred to in, in Q and A about how surely I also need like you know like have to have you know, that will transpire here, I think. Uh, so I'll be talking about the, uh, uh, the uh, you know, what's the hydrogen atom. We'll do this in two different sets of coordinates. Like, we'll see that it's extremely important, like, in which coordinates, like, you solve these problems. And we'll see that this, like, one half plus one half equals one, uh, sort of uh, lucky, uh, lucky accident, but happens in very different ways depending on what coordinates you're going to use, the parabolic ones or the spherical ones. In, this, in the case of the spherical one, you get like something that's known as the Langer modification. And then finally, I'll be looking at the, at the five structure. This is also like a problem, like a rich history. Many uh, uh, historians have written uh, about this before. And so I'll give you like a very sort of short version of how this works. Uh, I should say there's many more sort of in, uh, uh, examples of like where these factor, mysterious factors of a half like, are popping up like in the early 20s, and they all have sort of different sources, like spin, of course, like is a very important one. So hopefully, like in QA, like you know, we can do a little crowdsourcing and get your favorite examples of uh, where all of this uh, is coming from. All right, the, uh, the Stark effect. So uh, this was uh, uh, one of the guys like solving this was like Paul uh, Epstein working with, uh, uh, with Sommerfeld. Like during the uh, during the First World War, and so you know we're looking at uh, Hamiltonian for an electron in a hydrogen atom, like in an external electric field, right? So this is the uh, uh, yeah, the, the kinetic potential energy, and here is the this 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 funny E is the is the electric field. And we're now going to do this for reasons that will become clear in a moment. We're going to do this in parabolic coordinates, and the idea is that you don't coordinateize uh, with you know, like if the, if the electron is going around like this, around the z-axis, you take like a plane, right, where the, uh, where the electron is in at any given time, and that plane, you're going to coordinate with like sets of parabolas. So that's, that those are shown over here. So the plane you see here, right, so here you have the z-axis, like imagine that the whole thing is sort of going around the axis, and then the idea is, is that the electron is always between like, you know, a minimum and a maximum, both in the, for the, the psi parabolas and for the Eta parabola, so it's going to be somewhere in there. So you get this sort of tube you know, around the uh, nucleus in which, like, the electron is going to be is going to be moving. So you write the Hamiltonian parabolic coordinate. It's going to be some horrific 
expression right, that uh, you know I won't scare you with. Uh, and so now, uh, actually, sort of the second character like comes into uh, uh, that uh, Schwarzschild, who independently of uh, uh, of uh, or, or not quite independently. Uh, uh, of Epstein, uh, uh, like solve this uh, solve this uh, uh, this problem, um, and um, so this like ties in very nicely with uh, Jorah's uh, talk because it was actually Schwarzschild who introduced like these methods from like so the powerful methods of celestial mechanics like into the story, right? And so we Tony and I learned this from like a really beautiful uh, essay by. Uh, uh, um, uh, Rita Eckert on, uh, on, on Sommerfeld. And so Eckert like, uh, has there's this famous letter, now famous letter from Schwarzschild to Sommerfeld of March 1st, 1916, where uh, Sommerfeld already does like face quantization. Like, so so Bly was showing this, showing this yesterday, right? And it's Sommerfeld, it's Schwarzschild who is connecting this now to celestial mechanics. And he writes to Sommerfeld, he says like, oh, you know, only now that I've made this connection, is the stuff you're doing like really convincing for me? And then he says, there's violins hanging all over the quantum heavens, and he's going to charge right ahead. Okay? And at this point, like Sommerfeld like, tells his uh, postdoc, like Epstein, well, you better get on the sting because like, otherwise, like, uh, 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 Schwartz is going to beat you to it. Epstein, in a later interview, says, like, you know, when he heard that news, he thought that his only hope was that Schwartz was going to go to heaven, right? And would fit on some other problem in his quantum heaven than on this one. And so unbeknownst, of course, to, uh, to Epstein at the time, like he would get his wish, uh, Schwarzschild died shortly thereafter of like pemphigus, like a painful, like autoimmune disease, causing, causing blisters of your skin. It's amazing that the guy was doing his work and, you know, come up with Schwarzschild's solution, like, you know, when, you know, it's before he croaked. Um, so on the same day, just shortly thereafter, like later in March, uh, Sommerfeld got like both Epstein and Schwarzschild's like solution of this problem, and it uh, as it indicates here, like you know, it involves like some techniques of um, celestial mechanics. Uh, Tony has looked a little bit into textbooks at the time, and it seems that physicists and uh, astronomers just had very different sort of knowledge bases. And so Sommerfeld, like in response to Schwarzschild, writes for instance, you would think that he knows all this stuff. He says, "Oh, that's very interesting. I didn't know about this, and I very much doubt that other." Physicists know about this. But it's okay, so we have like you know, like something called Hamilton's principal function S, which is that as yet unknown function of the coordinates and the momenta. And this thing uh, S like is the generating function for the transformation from Cartesian coordinates to the parabolic coordinates. And to find an equation for this uh, for this S, you substitute, right, and this will look of course extremely familiar, like uh, once you think about quantum mechanics like replacing p by h bar over i d x, you replace like p of psi by the partial derivative of this s with respect to psi and so for the other um, uh, dimensions here. And you now stick those ds expressions into you know, the uh, Hamiltonian set equal to the energy, so you get this and this is called the hamilton jacobi So, and now the reason that you use these funny parabolic coordinates is that the Hamilton, Hamilton, Hamilton Jacobi equation of this system has the very nice property that it's separable. And what that means is that you can split this unknown function into a sum of parts that just depend on psi, just depend on eta, and just depend on phi. And so, uh, and that comes then with three separation constants, alpha 1, that's going to be associated with the energy later, alpha 2 and alpha 3. Actually, the, the dependence on phi is fairly trivial, so the first thing you can do is that you determine that this s, uh, this phi part of the, of the s is just nothing but the separation constant times phi. Now, the rest is still one humongous mess, so uh, again, like it's not very instructive to give you the explicit uh, expression for this, but the way it looks is that you're going to have a bunch of terms involving this derivative with respect to psi and otherwise, you know, involving like the separation constant alpha 1 and alpha 3 that only depend on psi. And then another part where you have the involving like the derivative with respect to eta, uh, other uh, separation constants which only depend on eta. And given that the sum of those two things has to be zero, you can infer that it has to be the case that those two parts need to be 
equal to the same you know, opposite number. That's the alpha 2 in the story. All right. Now you're going to impose, this is all like, still like, purely like, classical. Now you're going to impose the quantum conditions. And this is where like, this Sommerfeld like, phase integral quantization meets up with these more fancy ideas of, uh, of Schwarzschild. You recognize that this phase integral, right, the p here, you can just replace by this uh, derivative of the, uh, uh, of the Hamiltonian um, uh, 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 function, the Hamilton principal function, and you set that equal to some quantum number times h. And you do that for the psi, the eta, and the phi. And the n phi is then related, I'm using modern notation, to the absolute value of this uh, quantum number n. And these numbers, so far, right, this is important, can take on the value 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. All right. What we want to know, of course, in the end, is the energy levels. And so in order to get the energy levels, and we get one of those with and without the external electric field, what we're going to do is we're going to invert the relations between like the quantum numbers and the separation constants, right? So if you remember from the previous slide, right, we had like the quantum numbers as functions, now after you perform these integrals, of the separation constant, but what you want is just the reverse. You want the separation constant, one of them would be the energy as a function of the quantum numbers. So that again takes a little bit of hoopla. Uh, you know, we, if you want to see it, it's all like in glorious detail in our paper. But the end result is that if you do this without the electromagnetic field, you get something like this. And you see that this is just like the Balmer formula, and as long as you identify the sum of these quantum numbers with like the principal quantum number. Okay? This is the same sort of thing that Bly was showing us uh, uh, yesterday. Now you want to do it with, with an electric field. And this is why you were seeing like Paul Ehrenfest here in the background, because it's at this point that like another principle of quantum uh, mechanics that Bly and, and, and Rick has worked on this in great length becomes very important in the Yale Vatican. The idea is like the, 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 that it makes sense to quantize uh, these axial variables, as they're now called, like these phase integrals, is that they're adiabatic invariant. So if you switch on the electric field, their values will be preserved, right? What changes, what changes is the relation between like the separation constants and these quantum numbers. So now you get, and remember, the energy was just one of those separation constants, so the energy is going to change. And if you do that, you get this other term, and you know, you get uh, the, um, uh, the, this is, this is the, the thing that gives you the splitting for uh, the first the first order starter. Now, interestingly, uh, so uh, Ehrenfest, of course, had worked on the adiabatic principle long before like this, mar this happy marriage of the Sommerfeld and the Schwarzschild techniques, but shortly thereafter, uh, he published a paper, I think, in a, in, in a footnote to a paper in September of 1916. Um, uh, I'm looking over there, Rick, that, that seems to be right. Uh, where uh, he actually uh, uh, now hooks up this talk about the adiabatic principle to like what he calls like you know, Hegel's uh, uh, method, Steckel's method of separating the variables. Okay. And then you know Jan Burgers, like a student of uh, of AFS at Leiden, like you know what like shores this up, and so uh, uh, so was the story. All right. So now, uh, so this is all like uh, uh, very very beautiful. Now we're going to uh, we uh, we're, we're going to move to uh, to wave mechanics 1926. Like uh, both Schrödinger and Stark independently now try to solve this problem, and like it's very similar. The techniques are very similar. So now you have the wave function like factorizing in parabolic coordinates. You find the same formula as uh, uh, Balmer, but now you find that the relation between like the, uh, the principal quantum number and these other quantum numbers has shifted by this number of like plus one. And that is an actually like an extremely important uh, uh, improvement because like in the old quantum theory, in addition to these quantum conditions that are beautifully general, you have to come up with a rather ad hoc assumption that uh, n can never be zero, even in cases where the other ones aren't zero, right? When all three are zero, like we have a problem in the ball term. But even if n psi and n theta are not zero, you still have to insist on, uh, on this not being zero. And that was because like in that case, Rather than having like this little tube going around, now the, the plane is just sitting there and the orbit is sort of in this plane and you can have what I call a pendle bond where with the slightest perturbation like this, the electron can hit the nucleus, right? So they, they, uh, they rule that out. Right. 
So, you know, this, uh, the same shift is also found of plus one if you, uh, if you just solve the hydrogen atom in spherical coordinates, which you can do if you're not interested in this further, you know, ap application of like applying an electric field, right? That's why you use these parabolic coordinates. So there's this shift. And the shift doesn't matter much because it doesn't show up in the frequencies, like all the numbers shift with by one. And it also doesn't, doesn't show up in the uh, selection rules because that just say that the delta L has to be plus or minus one. So it doesn't matter that this is off by, uh, by, uh, by one. But it does, like really, and this is like the, the, the sense where you feel like the old quantum theory, they just got lucky. It really messes up like the underlying physics. Because in the old quantum theory, right, the ground state, right, corresponds to a state like of L equals one, because L equals zero is ruled out, because that would be this pendle bond. Whereas in the new quantum theory, you have the ground state, N equals one corresponds to like a situation where there is no A in there. And of course, like, you know, you can see that from, uh, so this is like relates back to like I think Jura's uh, talk, you can see that, you know, from the old quantum theory, if you take this picture of the orbits like very, very seriously, that this is an extremely mysterious thing that you could have like a ground state in which the electron has just no angular momentum whatsoever. Okay. Now, shortly after uh, the arrival of wave mechanics, like uh, there is like the work by Wenzel, Kramers, and Brillouin uh, establishing, you know, the still known, still widely used WKB approximation, which uh, particularly the work of Kramers was seen as sort of a halfway house between like the old and the new uh, 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 quantity. And the way this works is that, and again, you see sort of the relation that, you know, like Crystal and I were referring to, like in Q&A, between like uh, the, uh, uh, the old and the new quantum theory, right? And so, like, remember, remember what Crystal was saying like, on, this, on the side of wave mechanics. So you write the, uh, the wave function, here is this, this, uh, this S, uh, 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 Hamilton principal function, into the, into the one-dimensional Schrodinger equation, right? You, uh, here is the uh, substitution for this Hamiltonian, and what you get is that then the Schrodinger equation turns into the classical hamilton jacobi equation plus some correction term. And this, uh, you know, like was well known, uh, Schrodinger and Baldwin realized this, Norgan realizes this. And so, you know, that's what you're now going to use, right? And so to first order you see, like, you know, like uh, 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 throw out the yellow bit, right, that depends on H bar. Uh, you see that this is, you know, uh, is this here, and we're going to call that Px. And uh, this, of course, is the thing that is uh, 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 subject to this quantum condition in the old quantum theory. So now we're going to look at, you know, a particular example of a potential with two turning points, where the idea is like the motion is just, and here's the energy, here's the potential. So the, 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 the classical motion is just somewhere between these points, right, that it's like impossible to get outside. So these are called the turning points, and the motion in psi and the motion in eta, remember the picture I showed you, are of this time, so they're between like two turning points. So now you're going to write down, uh, again for the details I refer you to our paper, uh, and to uh, like Morse and Feshbach, who do, like the, uh, who do this in, in glorious detail. So you're going to write down the wave function, so in this area between the two points, it's this here, uh, and like for in the area outside, which of course is classically forbidden, it's going to be like this, where this pi of x here is just related to the p of x, but with an i here, because now of course this thing under the square root is negative. And the big point of the WKB approximation, where it gets like subtle, uh, is that you need to match like, you know, the various parts of the, of the wave function. And uh, we're going to look at a point x, like, you know, that is actually still pretty far away from these turning points. It gets really complicated when you go close to these turning points. And you find that the magic condition, like, for these wave parts of these wave function is this over here, right? And so note here, because otherwise you're going to be, like, bothered by some algebraic, like, small point. Uh, this is an h bar, right? There's h bar here, h bar there. You have minus pi over 4, pi over 4. Here is n pi. So, you know, clean this up a little bit, you see that these two, these integrals, like, go brought to the other side, reduces to an integral from just, this is one from xA to x, this is like, you know, from, or from xA to infinity, minus infinity to xB, so if you bring this to the other side, it's just going to be an integral from, like, xA to xB, and this is going to be it. And you're now very close to this, like, uh, uh, loop integral here, because that's just twice this, uh, this result, 
And you see here, like, you know, so now you get that this is just H, right? Here's the H bar is gone, right, from this uh, uh, factor of, uh, of, of 2 here. And, and, uh, um, and the, the pi that is still here is going to be uh, uh, disappearing with this, in, the, the, the 2 pi in the H bar. So this is it. So you see that in this first order in this first order approximation, that you get um, uh, uh, exactly what you also got, like from the uh, uh, in what we already saw, like in the in, in the in, in full wave mechanics, right? That you uh, you get this this, uh, uh, this this extra this extra factor of half, and you get it twice uh, because like um, uh, there is this extra factor comes up every time you have like what is called a libration. Where you have like an oscillation between like two turning points, you don't do this like when you have like what's called a rotation where it just the thing keeps increasing. So if you think about psi a and phi, the motion in psi and eta is a is a vibration, the motion in phi is a rotation. Okay? And so what you get then, right, is that uh, before you had just this was uh, was going to be you know the principle your uh, principal uh, quantum number, but now the, this picks up a half. This picks up a half, and one half plus one half equals one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now you can also do this like in uh, in spherical coordinates, like treating the uh, uh, the hydrogen atom, and then you do a transformation. And I won't talk about this like at all, so in the interest of time. And now you can rewrite this. This is like it involves r, which runs from zero to r. You can rewrite this as something that depends on x, going from minus infinity to plus infinity. The problem is now very similar to the one that we did before. And but now there is something interesting that has happened, namely that in doing this, so this is like the, that. You, this l times l plus one turns into l plus a half squared, and that's called the Lyapunov multiplication. And so what you get now, you only get in x, you get like one vibration that gives you one factor of a half. You can go one short, but no, no, the lamb modification gives you the other one. So once again, you're up with like the plus one that we had before, right? So the point is like uh, the WKB approximation shows you how, like using wave mechanics, using correct theory, how the old world theory could get this right. right? So here's just to summarize, right? So there's different ways in the in which you uh, solve the problem. So very quickly, then the fine structure. Uh, this is something that we haven't written up uh, uh, yet, but I'm not. Don't worry, I'm not going to give you the gory details of this. Um, so, again, you know, we're going to impose like quantum conditions, like for the radius and for the uh, for the for the angle. And uh, so, the first uh, quantum condition now gives you something like this, where like you have the uh, the eccentricity of the orbit here, and this gamma factor is not the usual. Now the factor of special relativity, but it's defined like this, where this is the angle of momentum that is itself quantized. And so uh, I'll show you these equations that look very unfamiliar and compare them to the uh, equations that you may be more familiar with in the classical case, uh, the non-relativistic one. So you have, in the non-relativistic, you, you, you would have this, and you see that the difference here is this gamma, right, which uh, 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 is often small, you know, like if, uh, because of what C is so big. And then, you know, you get like uh, uh, the relation between ex eccentricity, energy, and angular momentum is this. And that actually like is like a, uh, uh, even though these things look very different, that is sort of a generalization of, uh, or a relativistic version of that over here. And uh, again, like, you know, I, uh, uh, this is what it takes to uh, uh, convince you of that. And I hope that is reassuring enough that we can move on, right, rather than be talking you through this. So we're now going to look at uh, sort of ionization uh, uh, energies using the old quantum theory relation that big L, like the angle momentum, is just this quantum of L times H bar. That's the old quantum theory. And uh, in the non-relativistic case, we find this, right? And these techniques are very similar, you know, to the ones that I uh, uh, treated like more uh, uh, in extenso when you work on the uh, on the uh, Stark effect, right? It's very, it's same, same kind of story. Uh, and so, uh, uh, if you now do this like relativistically, right? So now the correction is not switch on the electric field, but the correction is like take into account relativity. You find that the Volva formula will get like a little change. We'll pick up, uh, we'll pick this up, pick this up over here. 
And so, uh, uh, and so there, you know, like comes now it comes in like you know the, the thing that determines like this uh, this uh, the, the deviation from the Baldwin formula that's going to be the fine structure constant defined like this. And uh, so then you uh, uh, you uh, to first order in that constant, you get this expression which looks a lot like the Baldwin formula except that you have this common factor like popping up. So in the old quantum theory, you now work this out, you get this expression for the uh, ionization energy. Now if you uh, do the new quantum theory, and you do this relativistic, but you do not include spin, that is to say that you do something like, you know, based on the Klein-Gordon equation, uh, then uh, all you get uh, is that you have to put in this layer correction, and then you get that this shifts by one half. That'd be a problem in and of itself. But if you now do like spin, and that is to say, like you don't look at the Clark Gordon equation, but you look at the drop equation, there you can also you get another correction. Again, you know, the, the magic line here is one half plus one half equals one, right? You see now that the, for, for the spin correction, you go from L to J, which is just L plus a half. All right. So the upshot then is that you know from uh, uh, because of Langer we went from uh, L to uh, L plus a half, and because of spin we went to J, which is L plus a half plus a half, and there you know everything is hunky dory again. It doesn't show up in the frequencies. It doesn't show up in the selection rules, right? But you have the same shift in like the assignment of like the angular momentum to the energy levels. So you get the other thing. So here, of course, the distortion of the physics is really bad because, like, you know, you, re you, re you realize that you don't, you don't factor the spin, right? And so this is, like, you know, from the from the uh, uh, from the from the point of view of the old quantum theory, this success is sort of accidental, and you know, we're hardly the first to notice this, right? So there's like in this book by Jurgrau and Mandelstam in 1979, it's been discussed like uh, uh, since. Uh, the idea is like, you know, Sommerfeld got the right result. I mean, this is like sort of mysterious. Like, how did he get like the fine structure constant right? He got it right because like two of the corrections that he uh, ignored effectively like answer one. Right. And that was my story. Um, well, first of all, thank you, thank you for the talk. Um, I think I want to challenge you on this notion of where they got lucky and how the physics got distorted. Mm -hmm. Because I feel that you can only make this point from the perspective of wave mechanics. And I would see, I think it makes a lot of sense to like sort of contextualize this sort of in the period after 1925. One could see where, whether the actors actually perceived it as such, as finding out where they got lucky before, because it sure as hell wasn't contorted physics when Sommerfeld did this in 1916. The bridge to empirical evidence was certainly shaky, but at that point, confidence uh, comes in, right? You have problems which you can worry about in great detail, but you're just starting this business. I don't have any problems. I mean, so, so like this, this uh, this, this, this was uh, uh, this was uh, uh, liberating. Sort of even ask how old quantum mechanics did anything right 
if without skip, right? And the answer would be, they did anything right when they had luck. So they have two, two halves cancel each other, like right? one half minus one half could be zero, one half plus one half could be one. So this has almost all kind of precise results of all quantum mechanics in this sense could be declared accidental because they didn't know the uh, But on the other hand, we can sort of turn around this luck into uh, a misfortune. Because we can, essentially we can say that had spin been added to all quantum mechanics, maybe the push for new quantum mechanics would not have been that strong, right? So, so, many, so many problems would have been solved out, even with the old approach, with the, uh, with the Victoria, with the uh, maybe just and by all, because uh, uh, many of the problems were accumulated before 1925 in uh, old quantum mechanics were related to some kind of mysterious half, half quantum numbers. In fact, the uh, zone got pushed for them without explanation, uh, war was strongly against them, but sort of this kind of unnecessary kind of half integer quantum numbers were kind of popping up in many places. And in many cases, in some cases, all quantum mechanics had luck to explain them or to explain them away. In many other cases, they did not. Uh, but and, and this accumulation of one half created this feeling that something was wrong with all quantum mechanics. And my feeling is that had spin been added at that point, uh, then many people would have been satisfied with that and would not, in some sense, need weight mechanics or other quantum mechanics. Thank you. Tony? Yeah, thanks. So, so, so that's like, it's in, in the end, like, you know, like in the old quantum theory, like, of course, you're very rational to sort of keep working on this. And out of this, it's, it's, not, it's not by out of the old stuff, or let's do something completely new, but it's out of the old stuff that comes this way. And then, but then the question becomes interesting, like, right? And that's the spirit in which like, the talk is offered. Like, how, how, could, how, you know, how could you get so much, you can get so many of these things right? And so, like, so, so Clayton did this paper on the, uh, 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 presented it in earlier on the uh, uh, specificity of, of hydrogen, where there's also like, you know, factors of a half like floating around, right? Like, Which had nothing to do with spin. Which had nothing to do with spin. And like as I showed you, some of the stuff here has to do with spin, but other things do not. Like, you know, so it, it's very much, of, it's a, is it a WKB problem, or is it a spin problem, or is it something else uh, uh, altogether, right? I mean, the, the, the other one, the other one, which is like, a, which can be held with WKB, is just the zero point energy of the, of the harmonic oscillator. Uh, and so before, like you have, before you have Schrodinger, the Schrodinger equation, like you have all these factors of the half popping up, but you don't have any sort of machinery to sort of sort out, like you know what is what, you know. And so it, it's it's in, in, in that sense that uh, you know, so it's in, so it's 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 really like like looking back at this period from the later one that you uh, that you uh, that you can point to these uh, to, to, to these features. 
And, and so I'm, I'm sort of happy, like in general, like in history of science, that this strong prohibition to this more rigorous approach seems to be seems to be evaporating. Right? I mean, like the, so. The, so this is how Hassel Chang is doing his book on water, and you get like the review by uh, uh, Michael Gordon from Princeton, right, about anti anti rigorousness and all that. So I think like we're, so. I, I was I was not just being flippant. I think there is sort of a sort of a liberating thing that we can actually ask these questions and don't get hammered by the department two of the Marx Marxists. The question was not about Britishness, but about sort of the actors in 1926-1927 looking back where you can tie your reconstruction, which I find fascinating, to sort of historical... Okay, so, yeah, so that we're, not, we're just, we're not trying to do, we're, we're really looking... So if, if I sound it, I'm not, no, no we're, not, we're really looking back from, you know, now we have like the, the theory in, in hand, and now we're looking back. And so we're, it's not time to do that, yes. Okay, so we have 10 minutes and four questions. I've closed the list. Shaul is the next one. Yes, you are. A small point which actually goes, I think, to the, the same direction. When you talk about, uh, when, when do you talk about ad hoc, and condition when do you don't when do you call in that uh, condition then there was something about the m that the m cannot be zero and this has a very clear physical meaning for all quantum mechanics that mm -hmm. you cannot have this kind of physical uh, system so and of course we impose on on our mathematics often physical conditions why this is ad hoc and others other conditions are not um, oh well It's not quite clear what the motivation is apart from the fact that they could they would be doing a correct calculation for that sort of orbit and they just didn't want to face what happens when the electron gets too close to the nucleus. So that does not seem to be a very profound. The fact that you can't do a calculation does not seem, at least to me, a very profound reason for excluding something out of hand. So with this, like, uh, so the, the, but this, this, forms, this can be tied to like sort of you know, hackers categories, uh, because like the moment that Schrödinger and and, and uh, uh, Epstein now do it in 1926, I'm not sure about Schrödinger, but definitely Epstein like mentions this as one of the big advantages of the new approach. If you don't have to put in any other conditions except for the ones that you just get the quantum conditions you get from the general formulas. And so in the and, and so in, in the old quantum theory, right? It, it, this is not the only example. I can't think of like another like simple good example. But, <coughs> but <coughs> on top of the uh, on top of the, the quantum conditions, you have to have further conditions to rule out certain orbits uh, or to rule out certain transitions. Between orbits. Of course, like parts of this get systematized with selection rules and all that. And uh, but the moment that you have to do quantum mechanics, you don't need any of that, right? You just follow your nose. And like you know, you get it all for free, like you know, once you have the Schrodinger approach, right? And so it's in that sense, you feel like you know, like, and that is something that was recognized by the actors, like you make like some important progress. Okay, so uh, Christoph, now. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, the talk, and I'm 
really looking forward to finally getting that, that mess in the literature about you know, how um, the point structure calculations um, um, ha luckily match the um, modern results um, straightened out because you know, when we were looking at that, there were at least five different explanations floating around that yeah. all seemed to contradict each other. So just one minor quibble. Um, something I don't understand about the accidentality here. Um, it seems like you're saying that since these two halves always add up to an integer one, um, um, things work out better, but then the reason you gave for that was that you know what we're measuring are always differences um, of energies, and there the offset doesn't count. But that would be true, of course, also for half integers, right? So what is it? What do we need the integers for? Why was it important that um, you know accidentally these these halves always paired up nicely? Um, that's a, that's a good point. Well, so no, no, no. But remember that uh, Schrodinger, Schrodinger did the fine structure first. He got he got the extra one half. But <laughs> the formula, the fine structure correction, was only a half and not plus one, which is j plus a half, or l plus a half plus a half. Which was wrong, and Shorty to realize that didn't fit, that it didn't give the right answer. Yeah, yeah, but you got a really actually different energy. Level. Yeah, you got the wrong yeah, energy, yeah. energy yeah. specifics. But I think that's why it's, I think it's, 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 it's not just a matter of any then you back off from doing, off from doing the relativistic <laughs> thing and then right back to a non relativistic structure. Right. Yeah, but so, I mean, there seems to be some. In fact, I think you're right that it would also work if you shift everything by a half. Because the reason you don't see it is like that you shift the. Uh, you know, the energy level is the same, and then you, and the selection rules of, you know, delta L. So if everything, right, I mean, that would work out. And for the start effect, it would work if it, if it were just one. It's a few guys. Okay. Um, so back there, yes. Um. Hi. Actually, I have just two parts. A, where was this work published? You say you have published this work? It's right on the screen. Where is that? So, it's in, so the, the, more, uh, the, 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 the more detailed papers in studies in the same philosophy of modern okay. uh, physics, and like there is a, uh, there's a more historical detail in this, in this book that just came out, edited by Finn Asselow with the help of Kraut. You, probably, you, you may be able to read it from back there. <laughs> so it's the, uh, it's the 100 years of the poor Adam, for a shout out of the book. Uh, 100 years of the Bohr Adam, and this is the proceedings of the conference in uh, 2013 in Copenhagen, where many of us were to celebrate the centenary of the, of the Bohr Adam. Now, a uh, second thing, actually, this has uh, bothered me for quite some time. I mean, it's good to get the spectrum. It's, I mean, of what Bohr's quantization gives you is basically the energy levels and so on. Uh, people, I mean, in classical mechanics, we know that we can not only, you know, we can also talk about where the particle is. So we're actually people talking about some kind of differential equations that will actually describe the position of these electrons or not at that time. Because otherwise, I mean, from their perspective, would this not be unsatisfactory? All you can give is just energy levels. So, something equivalent to the wave function, I'm saying, basically. Um, so so the, the thing that comes to my mind, but not many, but uh, uh, Tony has something to add to this, is that part of the attraction of like borrowing techniques from celestial mechanics was precisely you don't have to worry about like, the precise position. Like, so very often you're only, you're only interested in sort of periods of the, right, the, uh, of, uh, of, of the of the planetary motion. And there's these so many techniques like get you there without having to set without having to solve exactly what the orbit is. And so that's I think that served the purposes because like you know what you what you're what you mean uh, uh, you know as Ben Black later like pointed out like you know we
But are they really okay. saying that that's not something measurable? Or, or, or is it, that's why we're not interested in it? Or just satisfied? I think, I think, I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, 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 um, yeah. Yeah. Just, so I think, I mean, so to, to get back to, to George's talk, uh, like I said that people just took it for granted, like, oh yeah, of course it's going to be somewhere, right? Uh, but and we could, if we really wanted to, solve all of this and tell you, but this is not something that you would be able to uh, confirm in a lab anyways, right? So uh, uh, you don't see anybody like getting overly worried about this. Or worried about it all. Right? You just go straight for frequencies and intensities. It's and a then you find, and then you find ways that you can throw out a lot of this machine when you're telling me that. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> we, <laughs> we just have. Uh, like, yeah, I'll take my book. It's, I'll, 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 I'll Yeah? I mean, anyway, I think it's, it's a long, uh, we could talk through the coffee break about this and longer. I think uh, we can just go for the coffee and reconvene here at uh, 11, um, half past 11, sorry. <laughs>